some of the people are starting to come in. So welcome to you if you're joining us. Um, please tell us where you are in the world. Put on your chat exactly where you're coming from in the world. Get a coffee, turn off your telephone if you possibly can, and just uh, get ready to listen for the next uh, for the next few, for the next 30 to 45 minutes. So we've got Victoria from Sydney, first one from Sydney. That's a good call. That's where I am right now. Greg is in is in Perth, in, in lovely Perth. Mm. Where else? Anyone else where, they, where you are from? Very quiet. Hello, in our lounge. Oh, that's my wife, in our lounge. Yes, that's, that's my wife. I know who she is. <laughs> Everyone's been quiet where the rest of you. Auckland, Rogelio, good to have you here with us. We've got a question and answer. I don't know what's happening in that. Chris, we've got Chris up in the northern beaches as well. We'll give it a couple of minutes and let people join. Okay. Okay, well, folks, we will join with people come and keep coming in and sitting down. Um, just to look, introduce myself, my name is Ian Collier. I look after all of the tech fests here in Sydney. Um, it is wonderful to have you with us. Uh, from wherever you are in the world, I hope you have enjoyed your Easter. It seems like a, a little while ago right now, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it and, and are having a good day wherever you are working right now. Um, just to introduce what we are about, we, my organisation put together conferences and, and at this very moment, although we are isolating, we want to bring people together as much as we possibly can. So what we're doing is bring some fantastic speakers from around the world and people we know very well to share their insights and thoughts with you. Uh, if you have any uh, potential issues or things you would like to hear about, please let me know, because uh, what, what we are about at the moment is sharing and insights and advice and collaboration. So please just come to me if you have any uh, thoughts around that. Uh, over the coming weeks and past weeks, we've got some incredible speakers with us, and today is no exception. Um, we have got Greg Byrne with us. We've worked with Greg many years. Uh, he has been a keynote with us in all different countries around the world, um, as well as being an Olympian many years ago. Greg, if you remember, remember that those years. Um, he's an incredible speaker on leadership, organizational culture, and high-performing teams. And I don't think we could actually have picked a better title for a presentation than today leading and managing remote teams in a crisis so um without further ado i will hand over to you greg pleasure having you with us uh let me just um thanks ian uh, i appreciate the introduction and the uh great introduction uh and welcome everyone to to today's session uh such an important topic uh right now and, um, and, and the purpose of today's uh, uh, talk really is to, to challenge, have some thinking, uh, prompt some thinking for yourself. Uh, I'm, I'm also making the assumption that most of you who've, who are joining uh, the session are, are leaders, you're leading teams, you know, in a leadership role in an organization. And so this is in the context of, of how do you lead uh, teams and organizations through crisis and, and, and particularly in the context of, of the coronavirus, what are some of the things you need to be thinking about to, to be able to, to, to lead your teams most effectively? As you're going through, please, uh, if you have questions, uh, uh, put the questions up. Uh, Ian will, will monitor the, the questions and the comments. And, um, and, and if there's a question that's particularly relevant, uh, uh, Ian will interrupt and say, hey, Greg, can we just stop and answer this question? So let's make this a bit of a dialogue. I've got some, some, some content. And I'll talk, but the more we can interact, uh, the better, and we get we get something out of uh, out of today. So, in terms of of setting up the the context for today, uh, we, it's useful to introduce the concept of VUCA, which I'm sure many of you have heard and and heard heard this concept. It was introduced uh, initially by the the American military in the 1990s, and they trained their leaders specifically to be able to lead their people through a VUCA situation. So a situation that's volatile, that's uncertain, that's complex and ambiguous. And what's really interesting, if we reflect back over you know, the last 10 years, 
there haven't been really that many situations that have been truly VUCA situations. Whereas when we look at what's happening around the globe right now and in organizations around the globe, there is no doubt that what we're facing right now is a VUCA situation. It is absolutely volatile. There's huge amounts of uncertainty. It's highly complex and it's ambiguous. And, and so we need to be as leaders skilled in, in how, do we, how do we actually lead our teams through the situation and what do we need to be thinking about and conscious of. So when we, when we step back and go, what's, what's my role as a leader? Uh, uh, and from a, from a, and we, you guys all know this, essentially, ideally, your, your role is to, to generate the, 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 the right amount and best effort from your people, which is then going to deliver the results and the quality output that you want. Uh, and that's, that's our primary role. Your role as a leader is simply to generate the effort, get people motivated, purposeful, delivering what they need to be able to deliver to deliver the outcome and in a safe way that keeps people well, etc. And this is where uh, the, the, the key here is in essentially it's how your people feel partly around how they experience you as a leader, how they're feeling about their work and how they're feeling about their work situation. Now for many of you potentially, and, I, and I've got a number of clients through this situation, and most organizations have got a number of their people working remotely. They're working from home. Um, and so now suddenly this, this concept of how people feel about their workplace and about, about their leader and about their teams is actually quite significantly different. And as a leader, you need to be thinking about, okay, well, how do I need to be working with my team? How do I need to be communicating? What do I need to be saying? Then generate the feeling I want them to be able to be feeling, which then generates the effort. So it's really simple equation. What makes it more complex though is the VUCA situation. So now on top of this really complex equation, we've now got a much more complex situation. Uh, and we need to be really aware of, of what's the impact of this. How do people feel? And uh, I'm pretty confident that you all know and have seen this performance anxiety curve. And, and the, the, the basic principle here is that there's a level of anxiety and stress that's good for us. Uh, and that level of anxiety and stress that's good for us gets us to a point where we reach maximum performance. And so that's good. We, we all we know what that feels like. However, if we then experience any additional anxiety and stress beyond that point, then it starts having a negative impact. Our performance starts dropping. Uh, uh, it impacts our relationship, impacts my effort, impacts the quality of work outputs. And so that's not ideal. And potentially we end up right down in the bottom corner, which is not great. Now, what's really interesting about what we're facing around the globe right now is that many of us are in that red zone. Many of us on the, on the right hand side of that curve where we are feeling more anxious, we are feeling more stressed. But even more importantly, most of us three months ago, if we found ourselves on that side of the curve, We'd go, and, we'd go and do some exercise, we'd go to the gym, we'd go and meet up with some friends, we'd go out for dinner, we'd go and do something that then gets us from that red side of the curve into the green side of the curve. The reality right now is that for many of us, our typical strategies for managing our well-being are, are gone. We can't do it. And so I know for myself, I typically on a, on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning at five o'clock, I'm in the gym with two really good mates, doing some, some gym, and then we go sit in a coffee shop for 45 minutes. And that's my way of getting myself out of that red zone back into the green zone. I can't do that anymore. Which means that I need to now be thinking about new ways to get myself from the red zone into the green zone. And as a leader, you need to be thinking about your people and where they are in this zone and because they don't have the typical strategies, what do you need to be doing as a leader to get your people into that, into the green zone? And ideally we want to be sitting at around 90% of our optimum performance. Uh, so that if we then experience any additional anxiety and stress beyond that, we can actually deal with it. And that top little green zone, that zone of optimal performance is where we get, we get the most, the, that's where we get best performance, that's where we're most resilient. That's where we want to be. We want to be in that zone of optimal performance. And so how, the, the, the key is how do we do that? How do we keep our people up in that zone 
in the context of a crisis, in the context of the coronavirus. And that's, it's a real significant challenge. If we don't, the impact of being in that red zone is it generates a whole bunch of cortisol. And cortisol is, it's actually really helpful. If I'm getting chased by a lion to the streets of Perth, cortisol is great. Because what it does, it, 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 gets, it, it releases adrenaline into my system. My blood moves from my intestines to my, to my muscles. My blood vessels dilate. I get more oxygen into my system. I can run really fast for a couple of minutes and get away from the lion. But if I'm getting chased by a lion every single day, now I've got a level of cortisol in my system that now starts having a negative impact. So too much cortisol, my blood pressure goes up. It, it changes the way my body metabolizes sugars and, and, and fat. It suppresses my immune system. It means that my body takes longer to heal. Now, not only is this not good for us physically, in the context of the coronavirus, we know that the coronavirus particularly has the greatest impact on people who are immune compromised. So if you are super stressed, if your people are super stressed, they're going to have higher levels of cortisol. Their immune system is going to be compromised. And so if they do ultimately end up getting the coronavirus, far greater risk of, of not going well. And so there's no better time right now to be well. And in terms of leading people through a crisis, the number one focus needs to be, are my people well? Are they in that green zone? We, I have to minimize that the, the impact of that cortisol as much as possible and get people into that top green zone. Another way of thinking about this curve is, uh, is, a, is a, a continuum that we've adapted from the Canadian Armed Forces. And it's a really nice way of thinking about mental health. And so the, the ideal state is that thriving state. This is where we absolutely thriving, everything's fantastic. Uh, we're purposeful, we're goal-oriented, we're physically well, mentally well, uh, and that's the ideal. Most of us, three months ago, we're probably somewhere in that normal functioning. We're cruising, we're going okay. We, we love little ups and downs, but we're pretty good. I would say that most of us right now, uh, and most of your teams, most of the people working around you in your organization are potentially in that surviving mode. What's really interesting, we've got a number of, uh, of clients we're running sessions with, and one of the key things that I'm observing is that organizations seem to be more, uh, more busy now than they were previously. It's like the workloads increased. You know, you would think that the workload would decrease, but the workloads increased because people are feeling even more under the pressure. And so people are in the surviving mode. The risk of being in that surviving mode is that it changes our brain chemistry. And I don't have to be in that state for too long, maybe just a week, two weeks. And now my brain chemistry changes. My dopamine levels start dropping. My serotonin levels start dropping. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's responsible for me being driven. When I wake up in the morning and being focused and, and I'm goal oriented, I know where I'm going. That's, that's dopamine. Serotonin is responsible for my mood state. So as my serotonin levels drop, now my mood begins to fluctuate. I have more negative emotions. I get more anxious. And so the more we're in that surviving state, the more our dopamine levels drop, the more our serotonin levels drop. Serotonin is also responsible for the production of melatonin. And melatonin is necessary for me to go to sleep at night. So if my serotonin levels are dropping, my melatonin production is reducing, which means I'm struggling to sleep, which means I wake up in the, in the morning more fatigued and I get into this vicious cycle. And if I don't pay attention to this, and if you as a leader don't pay attention to this, you're gonna have people drifting further and further down into a drowning state. So there's three questions you need to be thinking about for your team around, around where they are on this. And the first question is this, what is your individual team's baseline resilience and well-being? Uh, and this is not thinking about their baseline three months ago. This is about what's their baseline now? Because most people were probably baseline three months ago was in the cruising phase. Most people. Right now, the baseline of majority of people working in their teams and organizations, depending on the scenario, are potentially in that surviving mode. 
The second question we need to ask is, what happens when I'm having a bad day? How far do I swing? So some people just have a small reaction. Some people have a really big reaction. They go right into that red zone on the performance anxiety curve. They get really angry, really frustrated. And then the third question we need to ask is, how long does it take me to recover and get back up to a good baseline? And these three questions are critically important. And what's really interesting when it comes to, to remote teams, uh, and particularly in a crisis situation, is that the responsibility of managing themselves increases significantly. And, and, that's, a, and that's, a, that's a significant shift. Because when we're in the workplace, we've got people around us, we've got other people around us who can check in, they can notice some differences, notice some changes, they can have the conversation. Now, without that, there's, there's a far greater responsibility of each one of your team members to be self-aware. And so if there's one thing you want to be doing with your team through a crisis, is stimulate conversations with them about how they are going. Asking these questions on this continuum, where are you today? Where are you this week? What's going on for you? And the reality is, is that all of us over the next three, six, 12 months, there's going to be bad days. There's going to be bad days personally, and there's going to be bad days in the workplace. And if we don't know how to manage those bad days and support people through that process, things are going to not go well. And so this, and this really, I guess this performance anxiety curve and this continuum sets the context for, I mean, in turn, when it comes to leading people through a crisis, the number one priority is the well-being of your people. That is more important than anything else. Um, and when people are well, when they're physically well, mentally well, emotionally well, they're going to be engaged. They're going to put the effort in. They're going to make better decisions. And so what I want to talk to you today is how do you, how do you support your people? How do you support your people to get them into a better place? So when we, when we think about uh, where people are at right now, uh, and what's their current emotional experience? Um, the evidence is relatively clear. And there's a fantastic study done recently in Australia looking at what is the, what's the, the, the current emotional state of Australians. And there's a couple emotions that are really high up there. Stress, anxiety, uncertainty, and feeling overwhelmed and isolated. Those negative emotions across the board, Australians are feeling. So we know that there's a heightened level of anxiety and stress. We know that potentially people are not sleeping as well because now their serotonin levels are dropping. We know also that people are feeling more isolated than they have done before. And particularly if you've got team members who are, who are single, who don't have a partner or don't have a family or don't have kids, they're, they're far greater risk for feeling isolated right now and potentially feeling undervalued in the, work, in the workplace when working from home. There's no doubt that people are feeling more uncertain, more overwhelmed by everything that's going on. Uh, we know also there's potentially increased levels of frustration. Maybe my bandwidth is not great. And I, on my WebEx call, the course keeps shutting down and emails are taking my, you know, ages to get through. Maybe I'm getting frustrated because my young kids keep interrupting me and I can never get all my work done. Uh, but so there's a heightened level of frustration across the board. We also know that uh, potentially people are feeling even more stretched by the level of work required. Uh, and then probably most importantly, particularly if you've got teams where people are working from home remotely, they're feeling guilty about decisions they're having to make about home and work. And so this is, and we'll talk about this, but this is really key. It's about reducing guilt, helping your people not feeling guilty about the decisions they have to make about what's important and what's not important. And so, we know that this, there's a heightened level of negative emotions uh, that Australians and people around the world are experiencing right now. And in your workplace and in your teams, people's level of emotional negative experience is significantly higher than normal. And in terms of managing a crisis, we need to know how do we address that? As I said before, we know there's a neurochemical impact, which ultimately is gonna impact on performance and mental health. So how do we address this? And this is where VUCA comes in. And there's four very simple strategies which I wanna talk through today that you can put in place against each one of these 
elements. So let's start with volatility. And this is, uh, and this volatility, this uncertainty about what the future looks like, uh, where am I going, what am I doing, absolutely increases anxiety. And one of the, the simplest things that you can do as a leader is create a clarity of vision, create a clarity of purpose and priorities. So let's talk about what does that look like? The first thing we need to do is, is create a, a vision for where, 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 where's your company, where's your business, where's your team going to end up? This is about creating an, uh, an, end, an end vision. And so what you need to ask yourself is, at the end of all of this, when this is all over, whether it's in 12 months time or 18 months time, what is my business going to look like? How's it going to be different? How do we want to be different? And start creating a vision. Because right now, there's an opportunity for every business, every organization around the globe. And when we look back in 18 months time, there's going to be organizations that have completely bombed out. They've just, they've shut down. They've, they, they, they have failed to, to get through the current time. There's going to be some organizations that somehow managed to just scrape through through this process, through this crisis, and they'll get through. And there's other organizations that will have completely transformed. And those organizations that have completely transformed will have gained market share. They will be, they will be going 100 full steam ahead. They will have adapted. They'll be working differently. And every team, every organization, the, the leaders need to be thinking about what is that vision? What do we want to be looking like? That transformation, what does that look like? Start creating a vision for what that looks like for your team. And, and I know we don't know everything, and I know we, we can't predict everything, but we know enough about your work and what you're doing and technology, all those sorts of things that are changing, to at least create a vision about what does that future look like for your team and for your business, and start articulating that, describing that. Another useful thing, and this is for individuals in your team to do personally, is create a goal about what does that what does what's a goal for me and my family at the end of all of this and when this is all over what's that one incentive that 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 reward that i'm going to have for my family at the end of this so i'll give you an example my my i've got two daughters a 10 year old and eight year old daughter and we've been talking about this as a family what are we going to do when this is all over what's that goal what's that thing we're going to go and do as a family as a reward for getting through all of this. And my youngest daughter, she loves turtles and she wants to go and swim with turtles. So we've agreed as a family, when this is all over, we are gonna go on a trip somewhere, then go and swim with turtles. And what it does, it takes us out of looking right now at what's right in front of me to what's the future. And if there's one thing that generates anxiety right now, it's because I don't know what the future looks like. I'm looking right at what's in front of me. I need to look up and go, what's the future? And we can do that by in your teams and your business going, this is what our business is going to look like. This is what we want it to look like. And then personally, encourage each one of your team members to create a personal, personal goal. What's the thing that they're going to do with their family when this is all over? And it helps. It, it lifts the spirits. It energizes people. It, it, you know, we can sit down with my family now and go, right, let's, let's start planning that. Where are we going to go? What's it going to look like? Where are we going to stay? We're not going to book anything just yet, but you know, we, can, we can start creating that picture and vision of what is it going to look like. We can start you know, imagining what it's going to look like and start telling stories about it. And that's really key. The other the really important thing in terms of reducing anxiety is to create clarity around what does that future look like? What's, what does that potential future look like? And the, the, key, the key thing here is, and this is, I see there's so many organizations and teams where leaders are focusing just on what's happening right now. And a, a typical response I see from leaders is, oh, but I don't know what the future looks like, so I can't predict what it's gonna, what, what it's gonna look like. Because most people, think about the team members, the questions you're probably getting are, 
when are we going to go back to work? When are we going to go back to the office? Uh, when is it all going to be ending? Uh, what does this look like? Because all these questions. And what that tells us is people are anxious about what this is going to look like. What we need to do is create a potential scope of the future. And there's only three things you need to talk about. The first is, what's the best case scenario? Second is, what's most likely? And worst case. Now, you might say, okay, best case scenario, folks, we're going to be back in the office by maybe July. Uh, we'll have a red team and a blue team. We're going to alternate teams, but we will be back in the work office by July. Best case scenario. The likelihood of that occurring, probably 20%. Most likely, it's probably going to be September or October before we actually getting back into the office. And that's probably most likely 70%. Worst case scenario, we're not going to be back in the office for the next 12 months. We're going to be working remotely for the next 12 months. And that's probably around a 10% likelihood right now. And what you do by creating this scope of what best case, most likely, and worst case scenario is, is you now enable people to make a decision. You enable people to, to talk about um, and make plans for the future. And, and I think this is, this is what reduces anxiety. This is, as a leader, one of the most important things you need to be doing is creating some clarity around what does that future look like for our business? What's the potential scope? And, and reduces anxiety. Now, I often hear people say, oh, but won't talking about the worst case scenario actually increase anxiety? Well, actually, it doesn't. Particularly if you've talked about best case, most likely, and worst case, it enables me to make a decision. It enables me to plan. That's what reduces anxiety. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to have the courage in teams and in organizations to just take a step. We don't know exactly. You might be wrong, but take, we know enough to at least create best case, most likely and worst case scenario. And then what you do is you constantly evaluate that. So you put a percentage likelihood against each one of those. And once again, it's not, it's not exact science but it's an estimation and just that estimation about what that potential vision looks like makes a significant difference. So create a vision for what does your team or your business, what's it going to look like in 12, 18 months time. Start articulating that. Then talk about best case, most likely worst case scenario. Start giving a scope of what the vision and that, and that future looks like. And then the third critical piece here, is then create absolute clarity about what is the priority right now? What is most important right now? And this is about enabling people to make a decision about where they spend their effort. What do they need to be doing? And, 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 uh, and because when you're working remotely in particular, people are constantly distracted by stuff that's going on we need to help people get clear on what is the most priority. So if there's one conversation you need to be having with your teams on a regular basis, it's what is your priority? What's my priority? Are we all aligned about our priorities? And then also what is not a priority? You want to build a culture and particularly right now and in any crisis, if there's one thing you need to be able to do, you need to be able to say no. If you cannot say no during a crisis, things are going to go pear-shaped and you absolutely will have people over into that red zone very, very quickly. In a crisis, we need to be crystal clear. What are we focusing on and what are we not focusing on? The, the best example of this is firefighters. So if there's a, a big bushfire, the, 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 the emergency fire department get together and go, right, let's talk about what's happening, let's identify those critical key points that we think we need to save, and then they prioritize those. And they look at their resources, they look at what is on the map, and they, they talk about, okay, this is priority, this is priority, this is priority. They let the rest of the stuff burn. It's not possible to, to stop everything from burning. And that is the only way to manage a crisis, is to get crystal clear, what are we, what are the absolute non-negotiables? What is the highest priority? And everything else we're prepared to let burn. 
uh, and so you have to be you have to be um, oh, what's the right word? You, you have to have the courage in a business to be able to just sometimes let some stuff go in a crisis. So create clarity of priority, and also allow your team to challenge the priority. So let them ask you why. Why is that a priority? Why is that not more important than that? You want to build a culture where it is absolutely absolutely okay to challenge whether the business has actually got the right priority. And that is the only way you're actually going to get to focusing on the critically important priorities. So if there's one thing to get away from, get from today, for me, this is probably the, the, the most important starting point in terms of managing any crisis is create, create some vision of where you want to end up. What does that look like? It gives people hope. It gives people something to work towards. I can then also start making decisions of what I need to be doing now. If that's where we want to get to, I can start planning. I'll start working towards that. Create a scope of what that best case, most likely worst case scenario does. And that reduces my anxiety. It reduces my feeling of being overwhelmed. It reduces that feeling of uncertainty. And then get crystal clear about what is my priority right now. So at least then every day I'm working on the right stuff. And if you just do that, that in itself is going to help your team and your people work successfully through a crisis. The second uh, piece is then around addressing uncertainty. And, and this is primarily around information. It's about communication and, uh, and, and fundamentally it's about transparency. It's about trust. It's about, you, you want to build a trust in you as a leader where you, your people trust what you're saying uh and, and and we know and you and you've seen it in the media and across all social media platforms facebook etc there's a lot of misinformation out there there's a lot of stories and a lot of gossip and no doubt in your organization is often you know pieces of information traveling around that really are not accurate and what we need to do is try and address that and that what that does it creates some clarity around what do we know? Now, there's three boxes that we need to talk about. The first is, as a leader, what's the stuff you know that you can share? And if you know stuff you can share, you absolutely need to be sharing it. You need to, you need to be communicating that on a regular basis and, in fact, over-communicate. In a crisis, rather err on over-communicating than not communicating. Because when you don't communicate, all that happens is we have this gossip and misinformation that occurs and people go and find their own information and now in today's world, when people go and find their own information and then claim that that's fact, we've got, <laughs> we've got a whole bunch of infamous information out there. So if you know something and you can share it, you share it. There's a second box. And the second box is, what's that stuff that you know as a leader that you cannot share? And maybe it's because it's commercially sensitive. Maybe it still has to be approved by the board. So you can't just share it just yet. Maybe for whatever reason it's confidential at the moment and what i see leaders often do is i don't tell people about that box but people know that there's that box we all know that there's something that you know as a leader but you're not telling me we're much better off not telling people what's in the box but telling them about the box and you say there is a box there's stuff that i know that in fact actually is going to have a significant negative impact on you but I cannot tell you about it right now. And you're much better off being completely transparent about that box. Because what that does, it actually, it builds trust. Because then you can say, but when that information moves from that box to that box, I promise you I'll share it. And then when it does and you share it, then it builds that trust. People need to, to know. And even if you just tell them some stuff that you can't tell them, that decreases uncertainty. It's a bit counterintuitive, but <laughs> it works. And then the third box is the stuff you just don't know. And once again, I think we need to, as leaders, have the courage to just be more open about what we don't know. We don't know that. Um, and, and what I would encourage each one of you to do as a leader is sit down with your team, and uh, it's probably virtually, and you talk about the three boxes. Talk about the stuff you know, and then tell them about it. Talk about the stuff that you know but you can't share and then tell them about the stuff that you don't know 
Um, and what it does, it builds that transparency about information, uh, about particularly as a leader, what you know, uh, and then you can assure them that when the stuff that moves from the one box, when you can share it, you'll let them know about it. I think the transparency of information is critically important. Uh, and I would err on over communicating and just being brutally honest. Uh, I also, the, the other piece here is I, I see lots of organizations who they, they try and fluff up the, you know, it's overly positive. And because I think, oh, but if I'm, you know, if we, if we keep it positive and we keep it upbeat and yep, we're going to talk about best case scenario, best case scenario, um, because we think that's going to, that's going to definitely make people feel better. It actually doesn't. It actually makes people feel even more anxious. You're much better off as a leader in a team and organization, just paint the reality. What is the current reality right now? Don't shy away from the reality. The reality is far more important to know in a crisis because then I can then make a decision about that. So if I'm working for you in a team and, and potentially I'm not going to have a job in three months, you're better off as a leader saying, look, you know what, Greg, in three months' time, it's highly likely that you're not going to have a job. Best case scenario, you're going to still have a job for the next six months. Most likely three months you'll be out of a job. Worst case scenario, you might be out of a job in a week. But if you at least just give me the reality of that, then I can make a choice about it. So please talk about reality. Don't, don't, over, don't focus too much on the positive stuff. Yep, we can talk about positive, but we also need to talk about the reality. Be realistic. The next piece is then uh, managing complexity. And many organizations uh, prior to the coronavirus were already relatively complex. Issues are complex, situations are complex, it's, it's complex. In a crisis, one of, the, one of the most important strategies to put in place is just simplify. Simplify as much as you can. In fact, as a, as a mantra, what you want in terms of any business is What's our purpose? And simplify. Simplify purpose. Simplify purpose. And if you can get that stuff right, it makes a big difference. Simplify everything you're doing. Simplify how you're making decisions. Simplify expectations. Simplify systems and processes. And one of the things we, we definitely want to simplify, in particular, is decision making. Now, when you're in an organization, when I'm working in an office, um, and I'm doing a piece of work and I get to a point where I need to go and verify something. I can very quickly just turn to my colleague and say, Hey, uh, Ian, you know, what do you think about this? Ian goes, yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, da, 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 da. I go, great. Thanks. I can continue with my piece of work. Or if I need to go and get something verified or checked by another manager or a senior manager, I can, I can go around, find them. say, look, this is, I need, I need a signature. Great. Done and we can get it done. When you're working remotely, as soon as um, I've got this complex decision-making process, as, as soon as I've got enough verify and verify and go and check and get the sound off more and more senior people, all we're doing is we're slowing down decision-making, first of all, we're increasing the level of frustration and we're making things more complex. What we need to do is just simplify the decision-making. Get your decision rights crystal clear. Help each one of your team members understand what decisions can they just make. And, and the more you can push down responsibility and decision making as far as possible, the more autonomous you allow your people to get and simplify the decision making. And get it very clear. You can make that decision, that decision you can't make. And that means when I'm working, I, I can work and then I can be very clear. Right, I can make the decision, done, get it done. If I can't make the decision, then I'm going to go back and check. So get clear on those decisions. The other thing to get very clear on is expectations. What are those expectations that I have of my people? What do my people expect of me? And simplify that once again around how do we, how do we simplify those expectations as much as possible? And then the third piece is then get clarity on what is it that we can control? Right now, in terms of 
what causing some of that feeling of being overwhelmed, feeling of, of being anxious, uh, is, is I'm trying to manage all the stuff that's out of control. Three months ago, up until three months ago, most people felt like they were in control. They had most of their lives in control, their work was in control, their personal lives are generally in control. We had a lot of control over where things are at. Three months now down the line, and you talk about control, people in general are feeling out of control. We're feeling like we, there's a whole lot of things that are just out of our control. And as, as a leader in a crisis, you want people to feel like they are in control. And so what we need to be doing is talking regularly, even every day. Okay, what is in our control right now? What is in our control right now? What can we do? What's, what's a possibility here? What is it that we can actually control? And what's not in our control? And the more, the more simple and the more explicit we can be about what's in control, what's not in our control, we enable our people to feel like they're in control. And that's how we change their emotional state. That's how we reduce that anxiety. That's how we get them into that green zone by helping the folks on what is it they actually can control. And that means then the effort they're putting in is more likely to result in a direct output. The, the last piece is then around this ambiguity. Uh, and, and the key here is to create a, a, a culture and an environment where uh, we, can be, we can be really agile. We can, we can adjust quickly to, to challenges. We can adjust quickly to situations. And the way to do this is you, you push down decision-making and you push down responsibility as far as possible across your organization. Just empower people to make decisions. Empower people to come up with new ideas. Empower people to experiment. This is, an, is a window right now, a window of experimentation. And there's no better time. And, you, and this is not going to come up again for the next 10, 15 years. You're not going to get this same scenario again. You right now have permission. You have the opportunity to experiment, try stuff, be agile. If someone has an idea, instead of going, oh, no, I don't think that'll work, go, yep, what's the risks? Let's have a go. Let's do it. it, it there's, this is the opportunity right now. And I, I promise you, we're going to look back in 18 months' time and the organizations that are most successful, that have come through this in the most impactful way and successful way, will be organizations that have experimented experiment with how you work, experiment with what works and what you can be doing. Uh, allow people to come up with ideas and just run with them. And the more you can do that, the more you're going to be able to enable your teams to manage the crisis, get through the crisis in a state of being well, as well as successfully get through with a better outcome. So this is, it's simple stuff. On, on, on the one hand, um, but I'm a big fan of simplicity. So in terms of crisis, just four things that you can tackle that will absolutely enable your team to manage crisis far better and far more successfully. The last thing I want to touch on is that we need to talk to our people and connecting to people, having conversations with them, understanding what is going on for them individually uh, in a time of crisis is probably the most important thing to do. And as leaders, we need to now more than ever be making sure that we are connecting personally with each one of our team, understanding uh, a little bit about what's happening for them, how they're working, if they are working remotely, ask them to take the laptop around or the, you know, the phone around and, sh and show you, you know, you know, where's the house and where's this, you know, connect people. Um, we've just had a, a client who's on a call now 
and a uh, video conference and they've had, you know, they've had i think it's about 300 people on the call and they, they've encouraged the, the the people to have their families around the the call as well so you're actually engaging the families in part of the conversation and part of the learning and the more you can connect people now and having conversations and connect people to their with their families feeling connected to work as well i think the more we're going to enable and support people to to work through this crisis so in summary we want to be able to create a clarity of what does that vision look like what what, 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 what how do we want to end up at the end of all of this uh, how do we want to be different and how to, how do we want to have been transformed to create a vision for that? Talk about the upside, so the, the best case scenario, most likely and worst case scenario, and clarify priorities. Make sure that you're communicating about those three boxes with your people and being absolutely transparent. Simplify. Simplify as much as you possibly can. In any crisis, the best strategy is just make it simple and ask everyone in your business just to simplify, simplify, simplify. And then the fourth piece is around delegate, delegate responsibility, delegate decision-making, uh, empower people to shift quickly, experiment, do things, because this is the opportunity right now to experiment and to try new things. And then lastly, connect to your people, support your people, understand what's going on for them. And then you, as a leader, share personally about what's going on for you. Talk about where you're at, what you're struggling with, what's frustrating you, what are you anxious about? The more we engage in that two-way dialogue about how you're feeling and what's going on for you, the more you're gonna build a culture around that. So we've got um, hopefully 10 or so minutes to, to have some questions, answer questions, and uh, it'll be fantastic if um, if uh, people can throw out a couple of questions or comments. Yeah, folks, brilliant, Greg. I, I really enjoyed that. And some of the stuff that did seem counterintuitive to what I was thinking, so uh, I thought it was really good. Folks, questions for Greg, any comments? No? Oh, there's one. Oh, hold on, there is one. Uh, a question... I'm joining a new company on June the 1st. Any extra tips for leading a new team via VC virtual? Well, oh, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and so the challenge there is you're going to be walking into this, or walking, you're going to be joining this team um, and uh, you won't have the opportunity to, to meet the team face to face. And, and it's really interesting when, I think we've we've become so dependent on that face-to-face -face contact for little uh, non-verbal cues, for understanding uh, those little contextual pieces of information about people, um, and we we form views of people. We connect to people uh, when we can see all of that stuff. The challenge when we when we're meeting a team virtually is we don't have any of that input. We don't have those, those little bits of context information. You don't get that intuitive feeling about, do I connect with this person? And, and so as a leader going into a team in a virtual environment, one of the most important things is, is find ex ways to start sharing information. So it's spending a lot more time uh, actually connecting to your team. So it's, it'll be almost for those first month, every time you meet, spend 15 minutes where you just simply talk about individual personal stuff. So what are you interested in? What are you missing most about not being able to go outside? Uh, the more you share those personal bits of information, the more people are going to feel what they connect with um, and start knowing more about your people. So you've got to, you've got to be overtly uh, far more, uh, connected to your people and having more conversations with your people about them and their personal lives and encouraging a culture of that. And maybe you as a leader, you can, going in, you be really open. You share openly, you talk openly about what's going on with you, get a video camera, show them your family and what's going on, your dog, um, and that kind of stuff, it just connects people. And I, I know I, I've, I've been running a leadership program for a client and um, we've been running a number of sessions over, over months. And uh, the last two months, we've done all virtually. And you know what? We, we still you can create some really strong connections with people, but it does require you to engage personally with some personal stories and personal information. So 
So ho hopefully that answers your question. Cool. Um, I, I did like the forward thinking bit that's, and setting goals. I think that's really important, especially at the moment when, you know, it seems as though the, when is the end of this? So I do like the idea of looking forward. I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good thing. Um, and, the, and the bit about actually painting the right picture about the, the, the potential bad stuff that could come down the line. I think that's really important because you, we don't hear that sometimes as, as individuals. We just kind of, we imagine it. And I think imagining it is probably worse than the reality often. So I thought that was good. <laughs> Thought it was really good. Um, Sean says, "Great, simple model, Greg. Thanks a lot, um, um, and awesome. Thanks from Rebecca. Loads of learnings and hot tips to implement. So that's really good. Any other questions before we wrap up? And what I will say that if anyone has any questions, obviously Greg is more than happy to. Um, have you got, have you got a screen with your contact details, Greg? But if anyone wants to contact me, I can obviously pass uh, the details on to you, and, and I know that you'd be happy to have a chat with them." So, yeah, um, absolutely. folks, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's wonderful having you with us. I have put on there a link to all of our other webinars that are happening. So please check them out. The, the past ones we've had and the future ones we've got coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Greg, thanks for being with us. It's always a pleasure. And uh, there's Greg's email there as well. Um, so please, um, yeah, just ha shout out to me if you have any thoughts for future webinars or any ideas at all. Um, and uh, have a lovely rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Uh, Greg, thanks for joining us, mate, and we'll, we'll chat again very, very soon. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. I really, uh, it's been fantastic to share these thoughts, and Ian, thank you for the opportunity. Very much appreciated. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers, folks. All the best today. Thanks.